Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the ACOM seminar series. Um, this week's presenter is Martin Euchre from University of New South Wales. And um, just to get a few things out of the way for our folks online, um, uh, you'll be able to ask questions at the end through Slido, which is below the live stream that you're watching right now. We have an issue with uh, our content moderation for Slido, so if you want to submit your questions, please submit them before the way end of the seminar if you can. Um, we've got someone in another room who's going to be moderating them, so uh, submit them as you go. Um, for everyone online and here, Martin said he's welcome to um, questions throughout if you want to clarify anything. Um, so just a little background on Martin. Um, He's got kind of an interesting career trajectory, I feel. Uh, he started with his PhD in high energy physics in Lausanne in Switzerland before jumping ship to the US to study atmospheric uh, science with um, Stefan Fuglestaller at um, Princeton University. Did you actually, was it someone else too? Jeff Vallis. Jeff, and, and Jeff Vallis. Yeah. Um, and then worked with um, Ed Gerber at NYU, then moved on to University of Melbourne and is now sort of settled at University of New South Wales in a uh, lecturer position there. Um, and this is sort of a, a thing, I'll, I'll just break the ice so that you know we get the embarrassment out of the way. Martin's one of those people that was kind of like an early career hero to me a little bit. I saw him at like an AOFD conference, AMS, it was a small conference, and he had all these cool visualizations, and then I looked up his website, and he's got all these animations and things for how you visualize three-dimensional data. And then he sort of carried that sort of interest in, in, in visualization over to um, how to actually present data and, and interpret data in a, I would say, uh, a very clean, objective way. I recognize the figure on the slide behind me because it's from a paper that I've been citing a lot lately that shows you how to scale certain vectors for certain physical fields so that you don't, I guess, get the wrong interpretation from them. Um, so he's got a really interesting, I think, perspective on how you, you visualize and use data. Um, the last few years, Martin's done a lot of work on strat-trope coupling and stratospheric dynamics, especially as it relates to sudden warmings. And today he's going to talk to us about strat-trope coupling in the Southern Hemisphere, which he now calls home. So, All right. Martin, take it away. Thank you very much, Nick. Thanks. Very kind introduction. Um, yeah, for me, I just realized only after we set the date for this uh, seminar that it was going to be Halloween. So I just, I just looked at which one would be the creepiest figure of all of my publications. <laughs> and that's the one I came up with. So uh, that's the uh, creepy EP flux vectors. Um, all right, so usually it's very special for me to be here because usually I have to spend about 20 minutes explaining to people what the stratosphere is. And clearly this is the place where I don't have to do that. So when I put together this presentation, I was like, what am I going to do in the beginning? How do I introduce? So I thought, well, you all know what the stratosphere is. It's caused the, that sunny place, and you all know that. So I thought I'd show you where I come from and where we are right now. Um, yeah, that's about it. And so I was asked to specifically um, talk about the strat southern hemisphere. So the theme here is going to be why is the southern hemisphere different and what is different in the southern hemisphere compared to the northern hemisphere, which is certainly the focus of most of you here. So what is different? The one big thing that's different is topography. So here, just a plot of the topography as it comes out of the GFDL model that I use a lot. Um, just along a longitude, blue is at 30 degrees north, six, and orange at 60 degrees north. So you see the Tibetan plateau in blue there, and also just lots of, you can see the Alps and stuff, lots of things going on. What about the southern hemisphere? How does this look in the southern hemisphere? The green is 30 south, where you get a little peak of the Andes, and then the red one 
is at 60 south. It's just open ocean. So the southern hemisphere is basically an aquaplanet, where the northern hemisphere is something where there's lots of land. So that makes all of the, the two hemispheres actually quite different. Um, so having this topography that's different, what, how does it matter for the stratosphere and strat drop coupling? Here is just, this is just a simple annual mean out of era five of the winds, so all means on the winds, and the arrows are our um, Elias and Palm fluxes, so um, result of the Rossby waves that go up into the stratosphere. And what I would like to point out is that in the troposphere they look about the same, so there's still turbulence going on, there's still the eddy driven jet and everything, but then because there's no topography on this side, southern hemisphere, the EP fluxes are weaker and, and as a result, the polar vortex is stronger. So uh, by the way, I'll, I'll use this polar vortex um, because I can't use PV, right? That would be something different. So I use the PVX as polar vortex throughout this um, presentation. Um, but it's not just stronger in some hemisphere, but it is also much less variable. So here again, a comparison Blue is the DJF histogram, if you like, or a KDE of the Northern Hemisphere DJF wind, so means on the wind at 10 hectopascals, 60 north in blue, and in orange, the same thing in the Southern Hemisphere for the Southern Hemisphere winter, JJA. And you see how it's almost a delta function. So in the Southern Hemisphere winter, the polar vortex is just there, it is very strong, and it doesn't move. However, what's then more interesting in the Southern Hemisphere is the green line, and that's in our spring, so September through November. You suddenly have this quite interesting um, distribution there, and this is why most people thinking about waves and strat drop coupling in the Southern Hemisphere really focus on our spring, on Austral spring, September through November, because that, that's when all the variability is really there. Whereas during the deep winter, it's not really interesting. All right, all right so what am I going to talk about? Still sudden warmings, um, because they are like the beacon of strat -trop coupling um, in the Northern Hemisphere, and I'll talk about what they look like and how often they happen in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and also, yeah, what they look like is what I call the life cycle. But then I'll also try to talk about non-Southern warming things because I'll show that Southern warmings basically don't happen in the Southern Hemisphere. So we need to find something else to talk about. And I'll, I'll concentrate on um, the effect of dynamical effects of ozone because I thought that this group is probably, can probably well connect to that sort of thing. And I think by this slide, I got tired of this font. Not yet, that's the last time I will show you this font. <laughs> um, anyway, so sun stratospheric warmings. This is one, um, this is one that happened in the Southern Hemisphere in 2019. Um, I know there's the 2019 sun warming in the Northern Hemisphere. They don't, don't, um, that's not the same thing, right? This is September 2019. And I'll start off with a little movie. Okay, that of course was a social media trailer for our, our paper, but the idea is I hope you recognize the smoke out of the bushfires in Australia, which were particularly bad that year. And there's been papers about, and there's still papers about coming out, how that sudden warming that happened the same spring also had an impact on those bushfires. 
So the thing was, 2002 is the only major sudden warming. Major meaning um, a actual reversal of the wind at 10 hectopascals and 60 south. So that makes it in the observational record, and that makes it one occurrence in 43 years. With one occurrence, there's no way to decide what the actual frequency is, right? You can't do statistics with one event. So in particular, when the next one came about, 2019, which did not quite satisfy, you see this over here. This is the U1060, this is the zero line. It just didn't make it, the, the definition of a major sudden satisfied warming. It was a minor warming. Um, Still, is it like, okay, none has happened till 2002 and now suddenly 17 years later is a second one. Is this climate change? What is the frequency we should expect? Um, so is it just normal? Um, and that was completely an open question that we sent out to try and answer. So we know it's rare, so we know we need long data sets. But what's the problem? So observations are too short, as I said, there's only one, or if you include the 2019, two of them, it's still not enough to have statistics. Um, go to CIMIT, uh, the CIMIT models. Maybe, but try and find daily data in the stratosphere in the CIMIT data archive. It's pretty difficult. Um, even though there are, there, is, there are some models um, which do that, but not that many. And also, it turns out, I'll show later, simulations are too short. And then what we had together with Thomas Reichler, who is at the University of Utah, he has these simulations with a, a, what he calls CM2.1 high, so the GFDL model, which is of the CB3 generation. But what he did when he was at GFDL, he, he or actually, you worked with him, right? Yes. So I, I don't know how much he did, how much you did, um, but, he never really told me, so maybe you did all the work. I don't know, but <laughs> definitely him. okay, definitely him. Good. So he has this, which does really well in the stratosphere, um, and actually any dynamics we try to evaluate, and I'll show a few slides because I all I know there's always the questions about how good is the model when I show a single model study. Um, but what he did, he ran it with 1990 conditions for 10,000 years, and he stored daily data on all level model levels for 10,000 years. And then because it was so much fun and so easy to do, he ran a second simulation with four times CO2. So we've got two times 10,000 year simulations with daily data of this model. And this, this, it's been used, this is, these are just uh, the papers that where we've been using the same simulations already in the past. So just a little bit of validation. Usually I have these as extra slides, but I stopped doing that because it's always the question, how good is the model? So here, just from some of those publications, uh, some validation studies, or at least a few figures on them. Um, so these are for the Northern Hemisphere, climatology of U1060, where red is error five and, and black is the model, both in the mean plus the standard deviation. So the mean looks good, variability looks good. Um, EP flux, vertical EP flux, the mean looks really good. The standard deviation looks also very good, so variability is really good. And this is an, yet another, which is a histogram. So it's at the given strength of EP flux, how many times, how many days do we count the given strength? And that compares extremely well as well. And then on the right is a study um, that just came out um, a few months ago, where, again, comparison era five with in, uh, sun warming in the northern hemisphere, where, again, it, just all the curves look very similar between era five and the model. Um, everything just works well. The downward coupling looks well. Um, and then turning to the southern hemisphere, a similar thing, if we take that model, mean plus a standard deviation, compare it to error five. Again, looks very well. And then if you compare that to CMIP six, PI controls, um, control simulations, which have this strong polar vortex bias exactly September to November, where we actually are most interested in. So it's kind of a problem using CMIP six as well for this kind of study, because that's exactly where they have the biases. 
Um, same thing with wave forcing, again, the blue being the model and the red being R5. Both the mean and the standard deviation, again, look very good. And I, I just, I could go on and go on. It's just everything we threw at the model, I was amazed how well it was doing. And sometimes I discussed with Thomas and he was like, I can't believe there must be an error there. But we, so far, we didn't find an error in these things. Um, and on the, on the right, again, climatology and interannual variab variability. So the only thing that really m is missing is the QBO, because the model doesn't do QBO, uh, which is these things here, um, right? The variability in the tropics. This is by season, DJF, DJJ, MAM, and SON. Um, and now, back to sun warmings. We want to do a frequency study. So why can't we use CIMIT models? Why do we have to use our own? Um, model simulation, so this table. These are, at the time, these are, were the only models I could find that had daily data at 10 hectopascal from CMIP6 in pre-industrial control. And so there's five of them, one of them, of course, being Wacom. Oh, and the other condition was all, also more than 100 years, because we're looking for rare events, so I knew we would need at least 100 years of this daily data. And so what you see is, I'll explain in a minute what SSW weak is for the moment. Just take it as a number of sudden warmings in those simulations. So Wacom produces 15 in 500 years, which is still not really a lot to do statistics, but at least you could argue, well, there, is, there are a few. And all the other models are less than 10. But the problem is when, yes? Martin, that's the um, pre-industrial run for uh, CMIP-6, yes. And then if you look at the future, if you also want to see how does this change in the future, we start to have real trouble. So there's no sun warming for Wacom, which before had 15, so there's no way you can do, and the maximum is one single event. So there's no way to do anything about the future, these things. All right, so hopefully having convinced all of you that this is the right model to use and we should definitely do this, let's go what we find. So. This is kind of a very, once you have the model and the simulation, it's a very si simple um, exercise. You just go and count the events. So I get 159 events in 10,000 years, which gives me one event every 63 years. Um, now, that's one information, but we might want to do just a little bit more. So what we did is that this is a histogram of the time in between events. So on the x-axis, so this is from 0 to 60 years in between two sudden warmings, between 60 and 120, and so on and so on. Now what's nice with this is that you can fit this black curve on this. The black curve is the survival function. The survival function is simply a binomial, which gives me, the, at the given, for a given interval time, what is the probability that no sudden warming has happened? Right? And that goes down with time, because even if it's a rare event, the longer and longer you wait, the probability that one actually has happened is larger. Right? So, and it turns out that this is a really good fit. So we can use the binomial. And the binomial, if you fit it, you find a mean interval of 59.2 years. So also in the 60, one every 60 years. Now, what's nice with this, when you can do this, you can start computing things you might be interested in. You don't have to rewrite the model or anything. You can use that binomial. So yearly probability, that's just 1 over the 59.2 years. But we can, for instance, say, well, we've observed one of them. These are major warnings. We observed one of them. So what is the probability to, to have exactly one within the 43 years of observation time? That's 52%. OK, what about, uh, sorry, less, so this would be zero of not having one is 52%. Of exactly one is about 35%. And the prob probability of having had two major sudden warmings in the observational record is only about 15%. And how long do I have to wait until it's more probable to have one than not having one? OK, statistics is always got to think about. <laughs> is 41 years, which is exactly the record when that paper was written, was exactly the length of the observational record. 
So all of this tells me there was no coincidence. We found one and exactly one sudden warming in the observation record. It's completely consistent with what we find. Then we can do a little bit more. We can say, well, OK, how many centuries are there with a given number of sudden warmings? So that's what we hear. Just look at the blue for the instant. I'll, I'll come back to the orange later. So most centuries have one or two sudden warmings. Again, exactly what we observe. But some centuries have even six of them, and some centuries have none of them. But the mean is somewhere between one and two. And we can also do a thing with the seasonal. So the one we observed was in 2002, uh, sorry, in September, um, which, according to that model, is, is not the peak. The peak would have been in October, but it's still you know, very much within the possibilities to have that. All right, so that's today. Everything seems consistent, so what about the future? Is the 2019 a, a um, consequence of Climate change. Well, we do the future with four times CO2, which in RCP 8.5 is about the year 2080. So we find 11 sudden warmings. So you have to run 10,000 years to find 11 events. And again, if we, if we fit the binomial, so to, in order to fit it, that's why these intervals are quite large, because there aren't that many, many events. Um, so we find a mean interval of one sun warming every 883 years. And the maximum interval was 2,769 years. So some at one point in the model run, you had to wait more than 2,700 years for an next sun warming to happen in the future scenario. So we can compute the same things again. How long do we have to wait until it's more likely to have one than not? 612 years. Um, and now we took the 80 years because that's from 2020 to the end of the end of the century. So what is the probability to observe another major sun warmings in the southern hemisphere until from now to the end of the century? Would be just under 9%. And two more is really, really tiny. Same thing, so I've shown, I'm showing this again. It's the same figures, but now look at the orange. So most centuries have no sudden warming, of course, and there isn't a single century. There's 100 centuries in this simulation, right? There isn't a single century that has more than one sudden warming happening. So in bold below my conclusion, we will not see another major sudden warming this century. Um, I think, if I remember correctly, the reviewers made me remove that sentence. But on a talk, I can still put it in. <laughs> because it's, it's purely probabilistic, right? But the probability of, of another one happening is really, really small in the future. And another conclusion for me, the 2019 event is not because of climate change, because it goes the other way, right? If anything, it would not happen with climate change. No, thank you. That's the next slide, the next part. Yes, you are exactly right. But what about 2019? Everybody agrees it was a sudden warming, but it doesn't conform to the northern hemisphere sudden warming. Um, and most people also agree that there were just the two, that there weren't really more of them which are um, similar. So how do we define something else that we then can look at in, in the model data? So we've looked at different things. So this is just U1060. Now the problem is so this goes below every now and then because that's a final warming actually, not the sun warming. But you see the 2002, in any method, you see the 2002 come up all the time. So the methods here are U1060, that's the normal major warming. Um, do a tendency based on tendency, based on day of the year anomaly, based on the southern annular mode, so first the UF at 10 hectopascal, at 50, at 100, and so on and so on. We tried lots of things. And the one definition which got exactly 2002 and 2019 and no other event was really the day of the year anomaly here. With, so all other years are way, are, are really 
very different to 2002 and 2019. Whereas in all the other definitions, you, you could also detect them, but if you detect 2019, you'll also detect other years, which we didn't really want. So this is the one we went for. So this is just the U1060 anomaly compared to day of the year climatology, and if that goes below 40 years, we say, okay, this is a 2019-like event, which we call SW weak, because it's just a weak vortex. So we do the exact same thing, and now we found that there's about one every 22 years happening of these things. And the binomial fit, again, looks very nice. And so we can do the same things, but I'm not showing this here. Maybe I'll be showing it later. Um, and I'll jump right away. Now the distribution of centuries, so you can have up to nine sun warmings of this in present day. And most of them are somewhere between three and six, seven per century. But if you get on to the future, again, most centuries have none, and there isn't a single century with more than two, even of those more common events, weaker events. And the mean interval in the future jumps from 22 years to 900, uh, sorry, 309 years. So even for that definition, for 2019, it gets very rare. And the reason being that the polar vortex gets much, much stronger with increased CO2 because the stratosphere is cooling and the, the polar vortex even more so due to uh, simple radiation it being a greenhouse gas. So my, 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 my bet still stands. Even those events, I don't think we'll observe another one. Ah, uh, yeah, so here I have the numbers as well. Um, so we can do the same thing, so um, which one would be, so how long do we have to wait in present day until it's more likely than not to have one is the 15 years. And between 2002 and 19, we're 17 years, so this is again very consistent with what we've observed. Whereas in the future, um, you have to wait over 200 years for that, and the probability of at least another one is, actually it's not, it's 23%. So I might, I might be wrong with, with that prediction, we'll see. Um, but of having two within 80 years is then very, very low. So one in four chance to have another 2019-like event. All right. Um, so now that we have all of these sudden warmings in our, in our simulation, we can also see at what's the life cycle, what are precursors, what forces the sudden warmings, what do they force in turn. Because we have 160 or 59 events, we can do nice statistics. And what we do is composite on them, and I'll focus on the major sudden warmings simply because I can. I have, I have enough of those events, and I expect those to be the strongest and therefore the most impactful. And I'll, also, I'll always divide the analysis into the early stage, which is at three months to one month before the onset, a mature stage, which is around the onset one plus minus one month, and the late stage, which is one month to three months after. Again, we can have these long lags because we have so many events. So first, what people usually call the impact is what happens after the sun warming. So here we have sea level pressure composites, anomalies, um, surface temperature anomaly, and precipitation anomalies after the event. And it's very canonical, if you like. It's really what we expect. It, it strongly projects onto the negative southern annular mode, SAM. And what people in Australia are very um, eager to know about is hot and dry Eastern Australia. And this is exactly where the uh, wildfires, which we call bushfires, uh, happened uh, in 2019. Right? So we see exactly that hot and dry and the negative SAM after. Totally consistent with what others said, and there's also, if you're not just focusing on, on Australia because you happen to live there, it's also cooler and wetter over New Zealand and cooler and wetter over Patagonia, or the southernmost tip of South America. But now, if you look at what happens before, the first three lines are still exactly the same. So our sea level pressure anomaly, although much more 
is only asymmetric, it still projects strongly onto the negative sum, we still have a hot and dry Australia. So even three months before the event actually happens, we already have a large amount of what we usually think of as the impact of the sudden warming at the surface. So what I really think of the main effect of the stratosphere is not this kind of thing, but it's more to make the anomalies zonally symmetric. At first, this is strong wave number one signal before the sudden warming. And after the sudden warming, this gets much more zonally symmetric. So I think that the main impact of the stratosphere itself is really to make an already existing anomaly more zonally symmetric rather than very localized. And so one thing now I want to look at is this here. This is a very strong precursor signal. Ah. Yeah, I'll get to that later. Okay. Um, still, this, these are means. These are means. So does every event do that? Or are there lots of events which ha don't have that signal? So in, answer to, in order to answer that, um, we did some PDFs. And now this is, we picked out different regions. South Africa, the Indian Ocean sector of Antarctica, Western Australia, Eastern Australia, New Zealand, the Pacific sector of Antarctica and Patagonia, and just the PDFs of each event, what was the anomaly in that region, and then create a PDF of that. In the parentheses is the mean value, that's the one I plotted before in the, in the, in, on the map, and the percentages are how many of the events are on one or the other side in terms of sign, what sign do they show. And if it, and the color is according to a p-value with a chromograph Smirnoff test. So if there is no shading, it's not significant, 10%. So if you look at that late stage, so this is the impact after. I'll start with that again. Um, Australia, hot and dry after? Well, it's not even significant um, if you look at not just the mean, but if you look at the actual PDF compared to what happens in spring, because remember, spring is the most variable season anyway. Um, however, it's pretty strong on New Zealand, Patagonia, um, and also about one third of the events have the inverse sign. So while the mean is hot and dry, one third of the events are actually cooler than before the sudden warming. That's for temperature, and then the, this shows the difference, the late stage versus the early, which hopefully is the impact of the sudden warming itself. And it's the same game. And here now, suddenly, the only really um, significant changes are of New Zealand, which gets very cold, and also Patagonia, gets very, which gets very cold. But again, now about 40% of all the events have the inverse shift due to the sun warnings. And so looking at all of them, so this is the, what I said, Eastern Australia is hot and dry, but it's already the case before, and it's actually, it's, it's um, significant before, but it's not significant after. And what else? The only region where in all three panels, the, the, um, the signal is significant is that one, which is cool and gets even cooler, and the, also the shift is significant. All the others have in one or the other panel, it's not significant. Can do the same thing with precipitation. Precipitation, so we said hot and dry is in Australia and wet Patagonia. There it is, but again, about a quarter of the events are actually making it has more precipitation after the event than less over Eastern Australia. And one third of the events have drier time after the sudden warming than, um, uh, than usual. And so I think I'll just jump to the full right away. So again, similar thing, Patagonia has the same sign and it gets stronger. So it, it is already, um, 
moister than normal, it gets even wetter, and this, the switch is also significant. Um, Australia, Eastern Australia is dry. It gets drier, but only a little bit because the shift isn't really significant. And what I want to point out here is that the only region which actually switches sign is this one. So uh, the Pacific sector of Antarctica, which has, is wetter than usual before the sudden warming, and then it has a significant drying shift to become neutral after. And I point that out because now, now I want to focus on this, this region. Uh, no, still no. Ah, okay. <laughs> because I have to do these SST modes of variability because everybody then asks me, what about ENSO? What about IOD? Here we go. Not much, really. Um, this is the ENSO signal before, during, and after the sun warming. The bars are for my PDFs for um, my SSV, SSW, so each event is, is, goes into the bars. The line is the climatology according to the seasons when these things has happened. And what you see, let's point out the p-value, which is, again, kolmogorov smirnov um, test between the two PDFs. 80% before, so there's really no signal, and it only goes down to 16% after. The mean is zero throughout. There is no, I cannot see any ENSO signal. However, the IOD, Indian Ocean Dipole, seems to have a tiny, but just significant at 3.2% level, um, slightly more positive. So the IOD seems to be before the sudden warming is slightly more positive, and then, um, then the changes, are, uh, the anomalies are not significant anymore. But maybe there is something with the IOD. Um, uh, but the signal seems rather small. So the tropical SSTs, I don't really find a major role in those. Um, wait, I, I really want to go to this now. Yes, let's discuss this finally. So what is happening? There's a positive sea level pressure anomaly, which looks like a wave one to our eyes, um, around here. Now, this is the place where the Amundsen sea low lives. And as the word says, it is, it is a climatological low. Now, the anomaly is positive. So that means this precursor is actually the low becoming weaker. So if anything, that should mean that the wave one forcing becomes weaker because the Johnson sea low becomes weaker. So how can that, how can a weaker wave one force the sudden warming? So what I think is happening is this. If we look at stationary waves, so this is just along this circle, 60 south of the sea level pressure. Blue is the climatology along long, longitude. Um, and here is where the Amundsen sea low is. And on the right is this whole thing the comp, uh, with Fourier decomposition, wave one, two, and three. So the blue show that there's mostly a wave one because it's higher here and then lower there. That's your wave one component. And the strong wave three component, that's one, two, and then kind of three. Okay? So that's the climatology, and this gives you your Amundsen sea low, which is here. Now this anomaly, what it does, is that it is maximum exactly over the Amundsen C, but in terms of wave number, it's almost equal between wave one, two, and three. But what it does, if you sum the two up, and that's the green line, if you sum the two up, what happens is that this thing that's there, <laughs> this smaller scale feature of the Amundsen C low gets ironed out thanks to the anomaly. And as a result, the green stuff, which is the total, has a larger wave one forcing, wave one component, and a smaller wave three component. So in a way, the way I see it, it's more an ironing out 
of something that in the climatology obstructs strong wave one, which then gives me wave one, rather than the forcing itself, so rather than this feature itself producing the wave one. It's more that it, what, what you know, made it have less power in the wave one now has more power in the wave one because that bulge isn't there anymore. And thus, the total has a higher wave one, and that, of course, can propagate in the stratosphere, um, even if it's, the polar vortex is stronger. All right, so waves. Now I'm at waves. EP fluxes, uh, these are upward EP fluxes as a function of lag and height. Oops, sorry, it wants me to update, but I'm never doing that before a seminar. Okay. Um, so as we've seen several times now, I think in literature, when you normalize that to the actual standard deviation at this pressure level, you see a strong signal in the stratosphere, but not really in the troposphere, until about two weeks before the event, which is very much like in the northern hemisphere. The big difference is just at the time scale. So this is two months. The whole thing here is four months. So it all just is much slower. But if you don't look at the time scale here, it looks very much like a northern hemisphere summer warm. Except that there's this thing at the surface as well. It's a signal at the surface. And so one question actually I got asked by a reviewer is, well, is this continuous or is this just a composite of many bursts that if you just have many events and the bursts happen randomly within this time period, you get a continuous flux of waves. So which is it? Is it really just a strong, long time wave forcing, or is it just many short bursts? And so in order to study that, we produced this plot. So x-axis is number of days at negative lags. How many days did we see when the EP fluxes were above or below a given threshold. So this is the strongest one, less than, so rem reminder, negative in pressure coordinates means upward. So this is anomalous upward EP flux, this is anomalous downward EP flux. This is a very strong upward EP flux, an um, intermediate EP flux, and a weak EP flux. And so we see only about five, most events have only like one day of very strong upward EP flux and some of them up to five. Um, but there's no, if it was a continuous forcing for every event, then we, we wouldn't see this. We would see like everything being here because it would be for a long time period and not so strong. So what this is telling us is that it's really a composite of many small bursts. So what's happening pre-event is just during the two months before there's all the time little bursts, uh, short but strong bursts of EP flux, which just do their work slowly and work the polar vortex toward the state that's weak enough for the sun warming in the end to happen. Um, yeah, so rather than having just something going on at the surface for a very, very long time. So the something going on would be something like an ENSO, for instance. Yes, Rhonda, please. In the previous slide, Yes, that's okay. right. And composite according to the events. Yes. Okay. Correct. So you are having a period of anomalously high EP flux going into the event where it's not continuous but rather volatile. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay. And this is just to show how um, this idea of uh, the wave forcing always just propagates as high as it can, erodes slows down the polar vortex, and this is, the, this is n squared, so this is the refractive index um, where waves can't propagate where it's negative, right? And so it comes down, and the fluxes, the, the anomalously positive fluxes here are always below this critical line, and then it completely erodes by the end, and the fluxes can't go up anymore. So just a, an illustration at trying to find a way to illustrate this thing of the waves coming up, 
breaking below the polar vortex, slowing it down, and then the next waves can, will break a little lower, and in that way, bringing down the anomaly through the stratosphere. Okay, this we've discussed. So, what else is there? What other things are there than sun warmings? And so I've already said, um, I'll look at ozone. I'm giving away the answer to the question I want to ask later. Anyway, um, 2020-19 sudden warming, again, the famous one, which is also considered by Snapsy now, uh, I've learned. Um, what's interesting is that most people look at this and focus, oh, look, 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 it's coming down, very nice, very canonical, exactly what we expect from a sudden warming. And there's papers about it saying how successful uh, our current view is of sudden warmings because it Propagated down, it gave us a negative sa SAM in the summer and everything. But when I looked at it, I saw this blue stuff here. Six weeks of positive SAM at the surface, which is completely against expectations. And what people called it was there was like a blocking or a stalling of the downward, something prevented downward propagation. And one of the ideas was that maybe the IOD, because that spring, the IOD was very strong. So I plot here the IOD during the same time, but turns out that the IOD really peaked at the time when this anomaly went away. So I didn't quite believe that it could be the IOD. I thought it must be something else. And so here's the question. What varies by a factor of three during a sudden hemisphere sudden warming, but is not included in any seasonal forecasting system? One, two, three. Thank you, exactly. I got to use that font once more. The ozone, which is the big elephant in the room. And so, seasonal forecasting systems, here are their forecasts. And there's paper out there saying how well the seasonal forecasting system predicted the 2019 paper, um, sun warming and negative sun. All the colored stuff is all, is all these different systems. And the black is error five. So this is our positive SAM. Not a single system has predicted it. And so, yes, what are they missing? Ozone, of course. So here is the black line is oh, total column ozone anomaly. The blue line is 50 hectopascal geopotential height anomaly. And the orange is, the, is, a, is down in the troposphere, the 500 hectopascal, which has exactly the other sign. So that's the blue. This here is the blue. And this up here is the red stuff. So kind of a vertical dipole, something different happening in the troposphere compared to the stratosphere. So you all have guessed the answer. So how does this work? How does the, can ozone do this? So what we did was to run a 30 members ensemble member with CAM, where we have a pre-industrial control SSTs, and then put in, in the control, we put in an ozone climatology um, before the event. And in the perturbation, we put in the 2019 climatology in the spring. So this is how they look. So the control run has our, has our ozone hole. And the perturbation run has this large increase in ozone due to the sudden warming. But none of these simulations actually produces a sudden warming. So all we do is put in the ozone perturbation. We are not forcing a sudden warming in the perturbation run. And actually, there is none happening. And then we have a second simulation where we do just perpetual September with this ozone in a control and this ozone in the, in the perturbation run. Just perpetual September. And I'll come back later why we did that. And here is just to check, a sanity check, what's the short wave forcing difference between perturbation control. That's exactly our ozone forcing. And so what do we see? If you do ensemble mean, uh, Polar cap geopotential height, which is almost the same thing as the southern annual mode. We see exactly the positive SAM at the surface and the negative SAM in the stratosphere. So we see exactly what we were after. And the only difference between the runs is the ozone. And there's two lines here. So I'm cutting out this time period where there's a, a strong positive SAM at the surface. And then do latitude pressure. Um, study of 
of what could have been happening dynamically. So this is geopotential height anomalies in the shading. So this gives you, this is a positive SAM with negative anomalies at high latitudes, positive anomalies at low latitudes. That's simply the, that is the manifestation of a positive SAM. Anomalous epifluxes, so there's anomalous down, which means much less, much, much less epiflux going up during this period. And these contours is, is the uh, stream function. So positive meaning clockwise because we're in the southern hemisphere, positive meaning clockwise circulation. And on the right, this is n squared, so the static stability in the shading. So we see a, a large increase in static stability exactly where the ozone heating takes place. So the stratosphere is simply being warmed on top, so you increase the stability atop the uh, stratos, uh, tropopause. And this is EP flux divergence, so this is the forcing of, um, of those, EP, the, of those uh, waves that are being deviated. I'm already taking away a bit of the conclusion, but anyway. So this is, this is exactly what forces this anomalous circulation. And the anomalous circulation then forces that sand. But I'm getting to that the next slide, where I have color-coded things a bit more. So on top is 2019 in R5. So that's exactly the same thing as I plotted before. And here is in CAM in our proper simulations. And I show, it's the, I show the same quantities, just color-coded them. So clockwise circulation in a troposphere, anomalous clockwise circulation, which exactly happened as well in 2019 during that period of positive SAM. And we have an increase in static stability, which comes along with a EP flux divergence in both cases. And that forces our anomalous circulation. So the idea is that we have increased ozone that heats up the stratosphere that increases static stability, and that those waves suddenly can't go up because it's too stable, so they're getting diverted equatorward. So that's those arrows going equatorward. And that forces, via downward control, forces an anomalous circulation, which corresponds to a positive sound. So we have this dipole because the ozone forces, via downward control, an anomalous circulation in the troposphere. And now why did we do the perpetual? Because in reality, so, we have, what, so what makes it come down then in the end? And so what we find is if you have a normal seasonal cycle, but in the end it will come down. But if you run the perpetual September, it never actually comes down. We always keep in this situation where we have a positive sound at the troposphere and the negative sound on top. So what we think is happening is there's two different phases of this whole thing. One is the immediate response to the ozone um, perturbation, which is a positive sound at the surface, negative on top, but then is some additional forcing. And in our simulations, this is simply a seasonal cycle. It gets much warmer. The vortex breaks down because of the seasonal cycle. And then you start having this downward um, propagation. And in the real 2019 case, you have, of course, lots of dynamical warming because it's a sudden warming, whereas the model doesn't produce a sudden warming. So that sudden warming is a lot of additional forcing which changes the polar vortex strength and then eventually comes down. So we, pr we propose this what we call a slow, fast response and a slow response. The fast response to ozone being higher stability, creating an epiflux divergence via downward control. We get the clockwise circulation and therefore positive sand in the troposphere because it's downward control. So it's only below where things are happening and that's in this case below the tropopause. While this is immediate, there's this other thing going on, right? be it the seasonal cycle or the actual sudden warming, which heats, in addition to the ozone heating, heats, heats the polar vortex even more, makes it break down, and then suddenly these EP fluxes are not deviated anymore, but they can now propagate because the wind is getting weaker. And then we have downward control, but this time all the way from the stratosphere all the way down which forces our negative sound. So the same signal as in the stratosphere because now the downward control works across the entire column of the atmosphere. And so is there any evidence other than 2019 that this happens? So this is just polar cap total um, column ozone uh, time series. 
Uh, and in red, I just, there's like these four peaks immediately. If you just plot this, that's all I did, just plot this as a function of time. You see these four enormous peaks. One, of course, is 2002 sudden warming, 2019 sudden warming, but there was also 88 and 79. And this is what these dripping paint plots look like. And this is the ozone, total column ozone for all of these years. And so if you want to see it, you can see a positive, negative when the ozone peaks. You can see a positive, negative when the ozone peaks. And even 2002, it's just the peak is so small, but you can, if you want to see it, you can see the negative down here for a short time and certainly at the late period and 2019, we've discussed this. And then the lower plot is something that comes out of another activity we have in Spark to find a different definition of sudden warmings, which is based on if you get all the events, all the years where total column ozone was anomalously high, you do a composite of that, that's 32 events, and you get exactly that dipolar. So this is from era five, this is not from model. But you get exactly the positive SAM and the negative SAM at the same time, which is kind of neat. So I think this actually happens and actually works. All right, um, so I plan to show more, but I'm aware, um, aware of time. So I'm happy to stop here or go on, whichever is more convenient. Um, because it's, it's 4.30. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe wrap up for now. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, yes. Um, yeah, if I have five minutes, I'll, I'll, no, no, I'll go to the, it's okay. My, my nice movie, which I can't show, it doesn't matter. Okay, here we go, I'll go, just go to the summary, okay? Um, I get to use that font again, once more. Um, so, what did we find? Major southern warmings in the southern hemisphere, I did that, but well, it's the southern hemisphere rocks, so it's all about the southern hemisphere. Happen about one every 60 years nowadays and one every 900 years in uh, the future. And slightly weaker events like the 2019 event, we should expect to happen about once every 22 years now, but once every 300 years by the end of the century. Um, but what I, there is a one in four chance of seeing another one until the end of the century. Otherwise, ozone plays a major role in the sun hemisphere circulation. Um, unfortunately, it's not included in any of the seasonal forecasting systems. And um, so the first point is what I've shown you, that it can force a positive SAM uh, when ozone is increased at a given year. And the one thing I was jumping over is that this is work done with uh, really Klein Garfinkel in Israel, he was spearheading, spearheading that, where he showed that when you do the ozone hole, um, when you do ozone hole simulations, you have this canonical response of strong polar vortex and therefore positive SAM at the surface, and that's been shown many, many times. But what he shows in that paper using uh, the idealized model MIMA is that, well, if you, that downward coupling is much stronger in an aqua planet than in a, in, a, in a configuration where you have stationary waves in the troposphere. So the conclusion from that paper is stationary waves, if they are strong in the troposphere, they actually act against the effect of the ozone hole propagating down to the surface. So the stronger the stationary waves, the less we will see the effect of the ozone hole at the surface. Okay. That concludes the talk. Thank you very much. Yeah. Questions. And also, if you're online, enter your questions now, because there may be a little delay in the moderation. Hi. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, so my question is, if we can expect less SSWs yeah. with climate change, does that mean less conditions that would cause the fires as well? Um, I don't think so. Um, the thing with the fires, I mean, those particular fires, they were at the end of a three-year drought. 
And they started in September, a month before the sudden warming. So, I mean, there's a good case to say that the sudden warming made conditions worse, but it won't, it didn't start the fires. What started the fires was three years of drought and people having a barbecue outside. And that does not depend on the sun hemisphere, on the polar vortex. Is it too much to Yeah, yeah, that's right, yes. Um, okay, that was a nice talk. Um, but in the northern hemisphere, the QBO has a lot of predictive um, yeah. power on the frequency of sudden warming. So you've left that out completely since it's not in the model. Yeah, that's correct. Um, so it seems like, well, I would have thought maybe you're missing some of what mm -hmm. would be warmings by not having the different phases of the QBO. Yes, that, that's, it, it's a valid point. Yes, of course. So the model does not have a QBO. And I mentioned that knowingly that that's probably going to, somebody is going to pick up on it. But um, I guess they are so rare. And if the QBO was really having an impact on it, it wouldn't take 40 years for one to happen, or even 60. Well, in that model, in the model, 60 years. But in our observational record, which of course has a QBO, we still only have, depending on definition, say two events in over 40 years. And a biennial oscillation cannot explain that, I think. Yeah, it would be <laughs> interesting to repeat it if there was a QBO, but. Yeah, but uh, yes, give me a model that can do this and that you can run for 10,000 years. That's, yeah. But yeah, it's a valid point. You know, there could be an effect. But yeah, I mean, a, a two-year period versus a 40-year period. And I know you have a question, right? <laughs> I, I, yeah, just a clarification. So for the Southern Hemisphere, the record of sudden warmings goes back to what, the uh, 1980 or something like that? Well, yeah, satellites, 79. Yeah, so 79. Yeah. So that's the last 40-something uh, mm. years. And... Uh, I wasn't sure. You seem to point out a couple of other events in that period bes besides um, the 2002 and 2019, or are the 2002 and 2019 the strongest events we have yeah. seen in this? Yeah. 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 So there's been there's been efforts after the 2002 sudden warming to try and go back into radio sounds to go back to 58. So we. So but there was no two, indication of. Or no. 2 and 19. Yes. And they haven't laid in the record, but you will think as the stratosphere cools, you should be having less. Not yes. Not more. Yes. So the only other factor that I can think of in terms of the temperature gradient of the stratosphere is that ozone actually yeah. uh, recovered mm -hmm. after around 2000. Uh, yes. Stratospheric ozone, just gas phase chemistry. Yes. So presumably yeah. the temperature gradient did get stronger after 2002, and that wasn't there before 2000. Yeah, so yeah, I agree that there could be. It's just that um, everything we did with that model, which of course also doesn't change ozone, is consistent with what we observed. Um, right, so you, you don't have that effect in there. But, but we don't but have, it, but actually I looked at... Award, well, you know. I, I looked at the ozone file that was in there to run this model, and it, it was actually one of the uh, higher ozone concentration years. Um, so yes, since 2000, the ozone hole recovered with this large variability, right? And, and, and it happens to be that in that simulation, the ozone is a rather high value rather than a, a strong ozone hole, yeah. Um, I don't see any questions online, so I'll just ask, um, related to this last point with coupling when the stationary waves are stronger, right, okay. I'm trying to segue into northern hemisphere then because an open question for still S2S forecasting the northern hemisphere is how much you need this sort of interactive chemistry and radiation to, to nail that sort of sub-seasonal time scale. So does that, should I interpret that as the ozone coupling in the northern hemisphere may actually be not as strong as the southern hemisphere because of the stationary wave forcing being, in general, much stronger. Or has anyone yeah, done any yeah, work on way, that? You know? Yeah, so, so the, the mechanism how this happens is that if you have strong stationary waves, they actually work against 
the cooling of the ozone hole because you have strong waves that still propagate. And when the polar vortex wants to get stronger because of missing ozone, those waves counteract that. And the wave forcing is actually a warming of the polar vortex. And then that whole thing. And then the jet shift in the troposphere is actually due to um, the, the eddy feedback of the synoptic waves. And in the two simulations, the thing is the one simulation that has no stationary waves have, has much stronger uh, synoptic waves. And that helps for the jet shift. So it's not, it's, yeah, it's not just the stationary waves, the, the strong planetary waves, but then in, actual, in order to actually shift the jet. There's two things. One is the reaction to in the stratosphere the response to a cooling due to missing ozone. And the other thing is actually shifting the jet. And one is done by planetary waves, the other one, the shifting of the jet is done by synoptic waves. Um, so there's uh, two different mechanisms with two different kinds of waves. Um, yeah, but I, I don't, it, it's really, the problem with the northern hemisphere with this kind of study is it's so variable anyway. It, so th this is a much cleaner experiment than the southern hemisphere where you have less stuff going on. So I, I'm not sure I would actually, I mean, I can't completely see your argument and it makes sense, but I'm not sure we can actually do that because the northern hemisphere is so variable anyway. So much stuff going on. And yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> but also to your point earlier about some of the effects and the distributions, like, and so people talk about it so yeah, deterministically, yeah. but I think it may even be worse on the distribution patterns for stuff like snow in the Rockies or something. So mm. definitely in the Southern Hemisphere, this stuff looked really clean. Even though you're being brutally honest with the statistics, I'm saying, you know, people still bank a lot on ENSO, but it probably looks much more heter heterogeneous yeah. Than, yeah. than that stuff. Yeah. So. It's, it's also, I'm a, I'm a bit worried when people, because there were three La Niñas now, and the polar vortex was very strong, and then they go, see, it's La Niña. But the 2020 vortex was strong because of the bushfires. And who knows if this year is strong because of Hunga Tonga, right? That's what we heard last week. Last, yeah, last week. So I'm a bit worried about this whole ENSO versus polar vortex, how this is coming out, because there's many different reasons. The polar vortex varies. Yeah. I have no other questions. Let's thank Martin. Thanks.